Okay guys, so after last month's sketchbook project, I was happy to reward myself with a brand new sketchbook and I ended up getting another mixed media style sketchbook. Um, I'm really happy about it because the last sketchbook got me so inspired to actually start painting in my sketchbook that for the past two weeks, that's all I've been able to do. and. I'm really, really excited about it because if you've been following me on Instagram, then you know that we've been painting with acrylics, guys. And I know I keep saying this, but this is a new medium for me. And I'm excited about it because not only is it a new medium for me, but it's one that I never, ever thought I would like. I always pushed it away. I always found it just to be just a lesser medium. Like it's that's what you use in like a classroom or with newer painters, but it's not really something that I could use to further develop my practice. So I'm really excited to be wrong about this one, guys. Let's take a look. So last week I did a couple of paintings in my sketchbook and I want to do another one today with you guys so you can walk through that process with me and see how I'm using them. So we're still doing dog portraits. With these, we're doing them a little bit differently. They're still dog portraits, they're still naturalistic, but these will not be sort of in that more classical style like you saw maybe in some of my charcoal or Conte drawings or maybe even in some of my oil paintings. But I think this medium, kind of like gouache, really lends itself to a much more illustrative approach. So you'll see that too. I don't know, there's not much else to tell you about this. Um, let's just jump in and start painting. All right, so you're probably wondering what the heck I'm doing. I have this sketch and I'm just covering it up with pink paint, but really what I'm doing is I'm just gessoing over the page. That's my preferred way of working in the sketchbook. I could just paint right on the paper, but the paper is very porous and the paint kind of just sinks in and the gesso just gives a better surface for adhesion for the paint. The next thing I'm going to do is block in with my uh, darkest color and I'm bl blocking in all of the darkest areas with a Payne's Gray, which is the darkest color in my palette today. The other colors in the palette are a red ochre and an ultramarine blue, a pale olive, titanium white, and a yellow ochre. And you might notice that all of these colors are opaque or uh, semi-opaque colors, and that is on purpose. So this is kind of a Zorn palette, um, but I wanted to use all opaque colors because I feel like acrylic paints are very uh, transparent by nature because you mix them with a little bit of water or medium to use them to make them kind of flow and because of that I like to use opaque colors. So the next thing I do once I block in all of my darks is just reestablish my drawing and I like to do that with a flat brush. I kind of do this when I'm painting with oils as well but I'm reestablishing it using some interesting line work that you'll see some of that will kind of remain and some of that will carry over to the finished piece. And that's kind of what I mean when I say that this approach kind of lends itself to a more illustrative outcome or product because a lot of that line work like you will see um, will kind of remain. So while I'm blocking this in, I can tell you kind of a, a funny story. So you're going to notice that throughout this painting, which took, I want to say about two hours from start to finish, there was a, a crazy thunderstorm that rolled through. So you'll, you'll notice that the lighting kind of shifts probably about halfway through, I would say. It's really funny because we lost power during this storm, but because my camera battery was full um, and because I have camera lights that work on uh, a rechargeable battery, I was able to 
light the the painting a little bit and continue. I was sitting by a window, but because of the storm, the sky got dark and all of the lights in the house went out. Um, but I was continuing to work sort of by by all of these other lights. So um, my apologies in advance for that when it happens, but that was a really a really interesting time. I like to paint in 20 or 30 minute bursts. So even though this paint dries really quickly, acrylic paint is great for that. Even in the palette, you have to remember to keep your palette wet. But acrylic paint dries really quickly, so you don't really have to take breaks. So it's kind of nice to remind yourself that you know, at each stage, it is good to sort of step away and take a break. Even if you don't feel like you need it, your eyes will readjust and you'll see things that you didn't see before. So it's always good to remember to sort of take those breaks. Okay, so here's what I want to admit to you guys. So after the first, uh, I would say block in, of all of the colors and their right values and their right tints for my acrylic painting and then a reestablishing of the drawing. I would say the rest of everything else that I do is just noodling at that point. Um, I'm just going in and looking for the small nuances, the cute little sort of turns of the nose or the glint of the eye or the ear fluff, whatever it is, that's all I'm doing. So I would say that the initial block in stage um, probably takes, I don't know, maybe a quarter uh, to a third of the overall painting time. And if I was honest with myself, I could probably stop there, but I would continue to noodle one of these paintings honestly for the rest of my life. Like if I could just if I just had this one painting to do for the rest of my life, I could probably do it. It would end up being a really thick and strange painting at the end of my life, but uh yeah, I mean, honestly, if you just come back and look at something over and over every day, you will always see something different. So so depending on how long I have to paint, and this day it happened to be about two hours, that's how long I will take to noodle on a painting. But at some point, I just have to sort of put my hands up and say, I think this is done. I think I can, uh, you know, I can honestly say that I've seen as much as I possibly need to in this picture. I've salt resolved uh, as many things as I want to resolve and I can move on to the next one with those lessons learned. Speaking of lessons learned, probably the most challenging lesson in this one really was not just when to stop, but how much detail to put in and where to really focus. I was really drawn to uh, kind of the eyes, obviously, because you have these two different colored eyes and they're just gorgeous. But then I was also really, really drawn to the slight shifts in uh, value and hue on the ears because they went from this cool gray to this warm uh, pinky color. And it was really interesting because as I was painting, I was just seeing more and more of those shifts and, and the, the, you know, the directions of the hair, um, I would think that I had it and then I would take a look again and say, no, no, there's something happening there that I really like that I'm not quite capturing yet. So I kept going back to it 
and uh, over and over, lightning, darkening, moving, changing the direction, shifting the shadows. Uh, so you'll see that, that that happened. And then also that happened sort of on the uh, neck the hair uh, where I was, I was really struggling with the transition because there's uh, this strange transition where the white hair is overlapping sort of the black hair and it doesn't necessarily make a gray, but that transition is kind of translated into gray by your eye. So that's a, sh a challenge as well. And then bringing the chin, the bottom of the chin out from, from that uh, neck was really also a challenge. So a lot of different challenges on this dog. Um, and not just challenges with the paint itself, but challenges with the image that I was using, and then adding on top of that, the challenge of the paint itself. One of the things that I do think I learned from this painting uh, more than the rest, and maybe it's just because I've had the time to sort of play around with it, is that I think it is more helpful to be more precise with your drawing. So sometimes when I'm painting in uh, oils, I won't even start with a drawing. I'll just draw with my paintbrush and uh, start there. But I think with acrylics, I think it really does help uh, to start with a more precise drawing, and maybe this is just me, but I think knowing more precisely where your darkest darks are and being able to use those to really create uh, a clear roadmap for the rest of your colors uh, and values more specifically is really, really helpful and will save, would save a lot of time. I think I could have probably spent a lot less time noodling on this and gotten it to the same place if I had been more precise with my drawing and laid down my darkest darks with much more precision. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys, but I feel like if you go back to the beginning and see how kind of loose the the initial block in was, you, you might sort of understand what I mean. Um, but that's, you know, that's why we do it. That's something to try next time. Now, as I get a little bit further along in the painting, you'll see that I'm starting to use a much smaller brush. I've moved from a large flat, flat brush, a large round brush to a much smaller, uh, finer point. I would say this is probably like a uh, size two, I think, brush. Uh, I like to use a size two flat brush a lot of times to get some like detailed, smaller little lines and um, even some finer points. I don't use really expensive brushes. I actually prefer uh, less expensive brushes just because I would say I don't feel bad about not taking great great care of them and uh, I, I actually I just don't find any difference in the quality of the marks that I can make or you know anything else I mean I don't get brushes where like the hairs are falling out or anything like that but I mean I have no problem spending one dollar or two dollars on a brush um, I've even been known to buy packs of 10 brushes for, I mean, $5. So that's less than a dollar a brush. And so as I start to think about how to get some of these finishing marks in here once I have the initial block in. I'm actually thinking about this along the same lines as I think about my gouache paintings. I like to think about 
the transition areas so I look at where a lighter color meets a darker color and I just you know I'm, I'm looking for those areas where I can add a little bit of a transition where I can maybe pull out a slight highlight where I can uh, bring some definition to a specific form whether that's a fold around the eye or a shadow on the cheek you know that some of those can be really really sensitive and uh, if you can pull those out just so with one or two brush strokes that's the best way to do it <laughs> So even though in acrylics we're working from dark to light, once you get into the finishing stages, you really are going to kind of bounce back and forth between, uh, you know, deepening the shadows and kind of refining those areas and then pulling out the highlights and the transition colors. Even though we say we're working dark to light, it's not a hard and fast rule. It doesn't mean that you can't put a dark color over a light color. And the great thing again about acrylics is that they dry so quickly that you really don't even have to wait. You can put down a color, turn around, mix another color, and by the time you've done that and come back, that color that you just put down will have dried and you can go right over top of it with whatever you need to. always comes a time in a painting when you really are no longer looking at the reference and you're really looking much more at your painting and just trying to decide what's going to make a great painting. And when I think about all of these sort of final steps, that's really what I'm thinking about is what's going to make this stand on its own because the people who are looking at your painting once it's done they're not going to be looking at it next to a photo of the reference that you used. Uh, they're going to be looking at it in isolation and even though it might be a familiar person or familiar object it really is going to stand on its own and so you want it to be something that truly looks good and so even if there was something wonky going on in the photo you have to decide if that needs to translate into your painting if that's important enough to make it into your picture For my purposes, I decided that I was going to test out something really, really <laughs> different for the background. So for a lot of the backgrounds, I chose it specifically because of the palette that I was using. So I would choose a color that was maybe something that I was used very little in the painting. Um, if I pulled it into the background, then it would sort of create that cohesive color palette. So for instance, if I wanted to do that here for this dog, I might have pulled the blue of his eye into that background. And that's what, <laughs> now that I see it, is probably what I should have done. 
but that pale olive was a brand new color that I just bought and I really, really, really wanted to try it. And I just wanted to see what would happen. Um, I knew that it would look interesting against the uh, pale pink of the ground. I knew that it would probably help the dog feel a little bit warmer, even though now that, um, now that I see it, it actually, the green is actually a little bit warm. Um, but I wanted to try it. This is the time for testing. And so I did try it and, um, yeah, I don't know if I would do it again. Maybe if the, maybe if this was a cat with green eyes, I think that would have looked really good. But in hindsight, I probably would have used a pale grayish blue, um, or just that sort of cerulean looking blue that I got out of my Payne's Gray and Ultramarine mixed with titanium white. So the only thing left here once the background is in is just to re-establish some of those edges, make sure that uh, they bleed into the background as much as they need to so they're coming in front of the background. Uh, and then I always like to, in the very, very end, just go back into some of the highlights or shadows, depending on the color palette that I have. Um, with that background color so you'll see at some point you'll see me go back into some of those areas and just give a slight highlight with that pale olive just to tie it in a little bit more to everything that's happening within the painting so just to create a little bit more cohesive look i'll just go right back in there and just tidy up my edges pull out a couple more highlights and then we'll call it done. Okay, guys. Well, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, video. I hope you enjoyed this demonstration. I hope you like this pup. And yeah, that's acrylic painting. And that's all for me today. So don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to see more. And yeah, I'll see you soon.